Good morning, everybody. It's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman, and uh, my my good friend David Zills is back. How you doing, man? I'm hanging in there. I've been a bit sick, but you know, um, I don't know if it's the time of the year or the stress of the job or who knows. But uh, I've had some forced relaxation. I'll put it that way. God, God makes us rest. Um, it, it's funny that, that this actually speaks to our sinful condition. He can actually give us a commandment about resting and, and hearing his word. And we're like, no, I'm going to find a way to sin instead. Um, that that he'll He'll drag it out of us. Um, and in the same way, he'll drag us before the word too. Uh, so if, if that's you today, uh, hang in there. Um, the Lord will sustain you. He is promised. But uh, for, for the sake of our conversation, um, it's actually one of those same patterns. Like I, I work myself into all but a coma and then I, I get knocked on my butt for a little bit and then I get up and I do it again. Uh, we, we sort of have these patterns that that we fall into over and over again. Um, we have, I believe, made a pretty compelling case for the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, you can choose not to believe that evidence, but you can't really deny that that evidence is is there at this point. Um, but why do we sort of keep falling into these these ruts of of skepticism especially when it comes to god uh, that's a loaded question i think that's an I know. important question i think that's an important question so one of the things that i learned along the way of wrestling with my doubts is um there's kind of two levels of thinking about doubts there's the the questions themselves and the the answers and the back and forth between I ask a question, I get an answer, I question the answer, I get an answer, I question that answer, and finally, at some point, hopefully, you're satisfied. And so there's the content, like the the thought content, but there's also, at some level, the thought process and the thinking patterns. Um, and some of the biggest aha moments for me have not been with the content, like the arguments for the resurrection or that the apostles were willing to die for their preaching or these kinds of things, but it was actually learning how I was being, how I was thinking about things and realizing that that wasn't maybe a rational or the best or the most healthy way to think about it. And it wasn't the way I thought about things in everyday life. Um, so I think talking about that is probably worthwhile. And we started it, we started to go there a little bit at the end of last time where we talked about the empty tomb and the idea that if you don't accept the New Testament's explanation that Jesus rose from the dead, then the empty tomb is this enigma. It's a mystery. Um, scholars, at least according to William Lane Craig, who we used heavily last time, mm -hmm. William Lane Craig says there are four major theories that have been offered to explain the empty tomb besides the resurrection. And scholars don't believe any of them. So then what do scholars believe today? And he said, they don't have an answer. And, you know, we also talked about how the the empty tomb, there's not as much consensus on whether it was actually empty. Um, there, there are Christians who will say there's good evidence for it and non-Christians who say, well, we're not convinced that the tomb was actually empty. We we outline the evidence for it. There's, there's good evidence that the tomb was empty. Um, but there's this sense that at the end of the day, you can say, well, it's just a mystery. And so that was something that was an aha moment that helped me to start unpeeling my thought process and realizing I was really obsessively skeptical in ways that weren't maybe helpful and that were actually making me think less clearly. Um, so, so the three options I realized for the, the resurrection, when I was reading Mike Lacona's, you know, 800 page book, he surveyed the evidence, it starts with theory of history, methods, sources on Jesus and his resurrection, the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, and then how do we explain the evidence? And then at the end, he's taking stock. It was very systematic. But at the end, he says, we've offered all these explanations for the data. And the resurrection is the best. But the second best is agnosticism, because anytime you try to um, uh, suggest an alternative theory, maybe... Peter had a lot of grief and that caused a grief induced hallucination. And then that somehow transferred to the other apostles. And then Paul had some weird disorder that history is only now suggesting that caused him to hallucinate. You know, these are things that are going beyond the evidence and they actually contradict what we know. Right. And so you have this level where you, you have three options. You believe the new Testament on the one hand, or on the other hand, you try to offer another theory 
but any other theory goes against the evidence. And so kind of in the middle, there's this option where you say, well, we just don't know. You know, we can't say that the, the answer has been lost to history. And I think of when I was looking at, you know, around Easter, we're coming up on Easter and around Easter and Christmas, you get all these popular ads or popular articles about Jesus saying, who mm -hmm. was Jesus actually? And right. there was this statement in a, I think it was National Geographic saying Jesus is one of the most enigmatic figures of history. And I was like, enigmatic, that's interesting. Why would you think that? And the reason is because if you start by assuming the New Testament has to be wrong, mm -hmm. then what's left? A huge, a huge mystery. Like we honestly don't know why, why did Christianity start if Jesus never rose from the dead? And if he was just a country preacher teaching people to love each other, like mm, scholars are yeah. still trying to fill in the gaps. I mean, the new Testament fills it in for us. And so when I realized, wait a second, there really isn't a good alternative explanation. The best thing I can do is say, well, we just don't have enough data to support the resurrection. So I'm going to remain agnostic and say, I don't know. That was when I started to realize, huh, why am I keep going back to the same picking away at the skepticism? And Jim Wallace talks about it when he's in, from his experience in cold cases, uh, homicide cases, he talks about when prosecutors make a case that the defendant is guilty, the, the other the, the defendant's attorneys have really three options. They can offer an alternative explanation of the evidence. And he said, and Jim Wallace says they rarely do this because it's hard. Cause then you have to, mm -hmm. then all the things the prosecutors are doing, you now have to do too for an alternative theory. And that's hard. And so most of the time attorneys don't do it. The other options are they can destroy the case the for narrative. They can destroy the narrative by saying, well, this piece of evidence isn't fully conclusive and that piece of evidence isn't fully conclusive. And that's what I realized I was doing with my doubts is I wasn't offering a robust alternative theory about who Jesus was. And I realized I can't because there's really no other theory that's supported by the evidence. Instead, what I was doing was I was doing like the defense attorneys and I was saying, well, this piece of evidence isn't conclusive enough. And well, maybe there's a hole in the argument over here. And that's good to do. And I, I think um, it can be helpful and God can use that. But if, if if you get stuck in this thought pattern, it can it can prevent you from missing the obvious, which is the case is actually very strong. And then the third thing that Jim Wallace says defense attorneys can do is they can distract. They can talk about peripheral details that aren't central to the case. And I think that's relevant for doubting too, because we've been focused like a laser beam on Jesus. Mm -hmm. What's the historical evidence for Jesus? Because that is where Christianity stands or falls. The death, deity, and resurrection. When it comes to saving faith, Paul says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth, Jesus raised him from the dead. Death, deity, resurrection. That's the formula. That That is the essence of Christianity is, is Jesus. And so we've been focused like a laser beam on that. Are there other questions? What about evil? What about science? Yes, and those are legitimate questions. Um, but it's important that those questions don't become the main question. Um, they're important and they might, they might be important to get answers until you can really... Um, have confidence in who Jesus is, because if you think science contradicts the Bible, you might say, well, the, if the Bible talks about Jesus, maybe what the Bible says about Jesus is incredible. If it's what it says about science is incredible. But don't forget the main thing, which is the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, but yeah, I think I think there are these thought patterns that can trip us up where we kind of poke and we say, well, what about this? Uh, maybe there's a gap in that argument. Maybe this evidence isn't conclusive. And that can miss us from taking a step back and seeing the big picture and saying, there really isn't an alternative explanation that makes sense. The New Testament really has the best version of, of Jesus when we look at all the data combined. Right. There are there are certain things that are going to sort of focus us, especially I think on sort of those distractions. And and we say distractions as if they're they're little minor details. But like, why is there suffering in the world if there is a loving God? It it is if you happen to be suffering in the moment, it, it it's not so much a distraction as that's the only thing I can focus on. Um, Sorry, we, I don't mean distraction in a pejorative no. sense. I just mean it's it's not central, but it, is it's, it it's is going it to be absolutely. <laughs> 
Right. But but suffering is going to be answered by the suffering and death of Jesus. It, it's not that the suffering and death of Jesus needs to be answered by suffering. Um, it's it sort of which is sort of the, the paramount question. And one of the things that that happens to us when we hurt, um, we, we've talked about this in, in sort of other episodes. Uh, but when 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 we hurt, we tend to get tunnel vision, like all of, of time and space shrink when we hurt to this one thing. And so like if you stub your toe on the coffee table, the entirety of the, the, the rational universe shrinks to your toe and the coffee table. And that is all there is. And you actually need something to come along outside of that pattern, that, that pain, that moment and say, okay, but also there's more stuff here. Um, otherwise, otherwise, all we sort of do is get wrapped up in this one thing. And the more we think about it, the more it hurts. Um, we, we need a, a resurrection to to be the centrality of it because there are these things that that will not only because we we are sinners who get all together too wrapped up in certain things because we we have a propensity by our own nature to to run from god and then quite frankly because it hurts down here and that tends to take our focus it, it's good to be able to be reminded not that these questions don't matter but that they are actually addressed by this resurrection because the, the question isn't so much um if there is a loving god why is there suffering the, the question is if there is a god who is willing to suffer and then conquer death and then rise again what does that say about suffering mm. yeah i think that's that's huge yeah um and that's always been how i've um thought about the problem of suffering is um at the end of the day and i i had a friend in grad school who had gone through a lot of tough stuff and maybe because of that also was very concerned about the problem of suffering from an apologetics standpoint. And we were talking over the, the kitchen table one time in grad school. And I said, it seems to me that the problem of suffering is fundamentally a problem of trust. It's not so much an intellectual issue as a relational mm -hmm. issue. And it's 100%. an issue of, and even the way it's framed logically is if God is all knowing, all powerful, and all loving, then why does suffering exist? And so the 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 data that the suffering is supposed to contradict things about who God is, which are really about is He trustworthy, and and that's where I find the the Jesus the narrative about Jesus so comforting is, um, I. I've said this before, my pastor as a kid growing up would talk about all distrust of God comes down to two things. One, does God care? And second, mm -hmm. is God capable? You know, maybe mm -hmm. God cares, but his hands are tied. And he's just like, I really want to help you, but I can't. Mm -hmm. Or maybe God can help you, but he's like, you know, suck it up, buttercup. You know, <laughs> uh, life's hard, deal with it. Um, and neither of those is very comforting, or maybe, you know, he's both incapable and doesn't care. Maybe he doesn't even exist, you know, and that's that's maybe the least comforting. Um, but I don't think we find an answer to that apart from the cross and empty tomb. But the idea that God enters our suffering in order to redeem it and work it for something good, I don't see a parallel to that in any other religion or philosophical system. Because the fact of the matter is suffering is a problem for any worldview. Mm -hmm. Suffering is a problem for atheism because there's no point to it. And so there's literally no comfort. This is just the way things are, like it or not. Um, you know, suffering, e every religion or philosophy has to deal with suffering. And only in Jesus do you have a God who is willing to suffer with us and for us. And mm -hmm. so the cross is the answer for God, does God care? And the empty tomb is the answer for, is God capable? And so I really like the way you said, you know, the cross and empty tomb are kind of the centerpiece that allow all the other issues to come into alignment. And some issues, I mean, we were talking before the episode, yeah. some issues about science and stuff like that, we might not have answers to. And does it matter? It might, it might make us anxious, Um but over time, I've realized, you know, science has been wrong, and there are a lot of ways of looking at these issues, even from within Scripture. And at the end of the day, my faith doesn't stand or fall with a model of the universe or how it's expanding. Like, none of that does Jesus say, by the way, you better get this straight or else, you know, I'm going to have, we're going to have to have a talk. No, he mm -hmm. says, it's how you respond to him. And so that's the thing that brings everything into alignment. Um but one of the things you said about, you know, 
I think is really insightful about the way when we're hurting, we get tunnel vision. And one of the ways I have hurt a lot is it's been intellectual, but it's also been emotional. And it's, it's the two words, what if. Yeah. Um, and That's I think the there's a favorite word, you know that, right? If. If. I, when, think about this. Whenever, Actually, whenever the it's... devil is tempting Jesus, this is how he leads off. This is the the question he leads Adam and Eve with too. It's always a question of doubt for him. There, there's something to that. Yeah. And I think um, that's where a lot of my doubts have been centered is a fear. What if I'm wrong? You know, what if I'm wrong about the apostles being trustworthy? What if I'm wrong about God being real? What if I'm wrong about God presenting himself in a way that is honest and not like holding some of him back that he like he's the sa eternal sadist or something? You know, mm -hmm. like you could have all these, you can conjure up all these things in your head and they can be very fearful. And, and so some things I found helpful to kind of circle back to the theories about the resurrection are to learn how to doubt your doubts. You know, so yeah. you can say, you can say, what okay. if, what if Jesus didn't really rise? And that, that, that can cause all, some anxiety. And, um, and sometimes those questions are worth digging into. I'm not saying you shouldn't discount them. Some of my greatest um, growth in my faith has come from leaning into the what if questions and God bringing answers to them. Um, but I've also had to learn that what if isn't the single most important question in the universe, because you can always ask it. I can say, what if the universe is like the matrix and it's an illusion and I'm just yeah. a brain in a vat? You can say, what if, um, you know, I all of us were created yesterday with our memories intact and what we think is the history, history is just an illusion. I mm -hmm. mean, you, you can even say, what if I'm the only thing that exists in the universe? This is actually Everything a legit- is my imagination, yeah. Yeah, there's, this is, there's a philosophical name for this view called solipsism, which is I am all that exists because if you think about it long enough, you can't prove that anybody that else have, exists. Yeah. Or that anything else exists, you know, you, you you only have access to your senses. And so these what if questions, if you take them to the extreme, they can lead you to doubt literally almost everything. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's important to um, doubt your doubts and say, you know, this what if question might be possible, but is it reasonable? And, and you know, one another thing you can do is you can say, well, what if it's what if this is false? But then ask yourself, well, what if it's true? Um, so you can say, uh, or, or mm. the other thing is, uh, it, look at the doubt. So maybe Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And so you're doubting Christianity and saying, what if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? Well, maybe you should also doubt that view and say, well, is there evidence that he did rise from the dead? Treat everything fairly, you know, don't. And I think to get at your question that you started out with, um, I think in our culture, we have a habit and it's not even rational at this point. It's like a knee-jerk reaction. We don't even think about it. If if there's something about Jesus and God, we have to be skeptical. Like, it's just, you don't yeah. even think about it. You just do it because it's what you're supposed to do. Why? We don't know. Right. We've just been doing it for hundreds of years. And so sometimes realizing, mm -hmm. oh, wait, I'm being uber skeptical about this one thing that I'm not about anything else and asking yourself why. Um, why am I so skeptical? It's like the Joker. Why so serious? But you know, why so skeptical? Yeah. But um, but I also um, you know, we've kind of been poo pooing. Not really, but it it could sound like we're poo pooing legitimate questions. And I want to emphasize: sometimes God gives us these questions. You know, we talk about the devil being the originator of doubt. I. I can't prove this biblically or I haven't thought about it long enough, but I think some doubts can actually be God given because, or at least God allowed because so, he wants, he wants to grow you and mm -hmm. use you. Uh, so just an example, um, looking back, there was a phase in my spiritual journey when I was like, okay, you know, I think the evidence is good that Jesus rose from the dead. All right. How do I know that the Christian teaching about the meaning of his death, I mean, the fact of his death and resurrection, fine. How do I know that there was actually atonement there, that some, my sins were involved, that somehow that's the key to eternity and nothing else? And I, oh, by the way, I was also skeptical that Paul was inspired and inerrant because Paul didn't go with Jesus. Jesus never said, 
by the way, I'm going to send this guy named Paul who right now doesn't believe in me, but listen to what he writes in these, you know, seven or whatever, 12 books, because they're going to be my words. He never said that. So I was like, if I can't trust Paul, which Lutherans love to go back to Paul and proof text him, I was like, I can't do that because I don't know if Paul was inspired. So that these were my questions, maybe a little bit obsessive, but the thing was by leaning into those, I got answers. And the crazy thing was looking back, I thought that was maybe maybe a little extra, maybe a little much. But the thing is, a couple of years after that, I was talking to a Muslim friend at Purdue and he said, yeah, so, you know, Muslims don't believe all that stuff about Jesus dying for our sins. Um, is, is there actually evidence for that? And by the way, don't use Paul because Muslims don't acknowledge yeah. Paul. And I was like, you're kidding me. I literally have had this same exact weird question. And so, you know, I think God can put stuff on our hearts because it's uncomfortable, but he's using it to grow us because he wants to use us in the future. And so I don't think we have to be afraid of that. I think keeping in check our what if questions and saying, are we are we being reasonable about this? Or are we being irrational about our what ifs? But sometimes there are just legitimate questions we have to lean into, and that's not a bad thing. Yeah, so uh, Jesus actually does this to Philip in the feeding of the 5,000. Like, if you want to sort of wrestle with it inside of the scriptures, uh, it's the feeding of the 5,000. There's this giant crowd, and um, they're, they're all coming to Jesus. They're going to faint if they don't eat soon. And Jesus actually, the, the scriptures say, he looked at Philip and he said, where are we to buy bread that these people may eat? For he himself knew what he was going to do. He puts it on Philip to actually wrestle with the the utter ridiculousness of the situation, the, the despair of it, so that, so that he can teach. So God tests us to strengthen our faith, not so that we can figure out more about our, not so that he can figure out what we will do, but God tests us so that we will figure out what he will do. Mm -hmm. The devil tempts us, uh, but but this is the distinction. When when God tests us, it, bring, it brings us closer to Jesus. When the devil tempts us, it's to drive us away. In the middle of the question, you're not going to know which one's which, but the answers don't actually change. And so we we still go and look for the same things. It's It's a place where even then God can use the temptation of the evil one for good. Yeah, I think that's the 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 really encouraging thing in all of this. It's it's been very stressful for me, very anxiety inducing to wrestle with these and to feel like my whole world is upside down. Mm -hmm. But as God has brought things into alignment and connected the dots, I have become so much more confident in my faith to the point where I mean, I can have conversations at work at a big corporation defense contractor about faith and people like talking to me about it. Like who would have thought? And yeah. it's because I feel comfortable with this stuff. And if people throw a, well, what about this? I'm like, Hey, that's a good thought. I probably thought about that. And so God can do incredible things through these things. And so, um, yeah, I guess just encouragement to maybe sum up, how do you deal with that doubt? I think dealing with the content, you have to have content. You have to have answers to the questions. If you don't think there are any answers, you're going to be led to despair. And I think that's where as a as a church, we have to be willing to go there and we have to be aware of the, the conversations that are going on in our culture so that when people have questions, we can point them to resources and not just say, I don't know, this is what the Bible says. I mean, there's an element yeah. that comes down to that. But you have to go deeper than that in a lot of cases 100%. to really satisfy people. Second thing is, um, I think learning to doubt your doubts and be willing to look at both sides of the coin and not wait skepticism way up here and faith as like totally like bogus down here, but say, let's let's put them on a level playing field. Mm -hmm. And then I think the third thing is um, just having a culture where this these kinds of conversations are invited um, you know, a lot of struggles in the church, people love talking about them. Like I'm struggling with my finances. All right, let's go. We got Dave Ramsey and all these things, or, you know, I'm struggling with pornography. Okay. We got lots of resources. I'm struggling with doubt. He said the right. D word. We can't talk yeah. about that. We can't acknowledge that. And it's, that's really destructive because then, mm -hmm. then we're isolated and Satan loves to, you know, the, make these things larger than life when we're isolated. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us to encourage each other and say, hey, I'm actually struggling with that same thing. And one of the best things you can do when you're struggling with that is find someone who's had those questions and worked cool. through them before you. Because if, if this is only theoretical to someone, they're probably going to give you like halfway answers that don't really satisfy you. And it's because they haven't really wrestled with it. They haven't thought about it as deeply as you. And so anything 
that they do to try to answer it is going to be surface level to you because you're going 10 levels deeper. So find mm -hmm. someone who's who's really wrestled with it, but come out on the other side. And that can do two things. One, it can actually help you with the content because they can help you with the thought process, with the with the arguments, with the questions, the answers, all that stuff. But second of all, it gives you hope because it shows, hey, here's an example of someone who's asked this question and it didn't totally defeat them. It's hey. it's the sense that, you know, there it's possible to ask this question and come out on the other side. And so I think, you know, we've talked a lot about evidence for Jesus. And I think that's important to content questions. But another thing I think is really important as a church is creating a culture where we can have these conversations and encourage each other. Because the fact is we live in a culture where there is skepticism on many fronts, not just intellectual, but emotional questions of identity, all these things. And growing up in this, if you're at some point, you're going to be confronted with it. And we've got to have a culture where these things are invited to say, hey, let's have a conversation. God just doesn't live in the Lutheran or Christian bubble. He lives out right. everywhere. He created everything. He's not afraid of these things. And so um, I think that's a way we can really encourage each other. David, thanks so much. That was super helpful. Yeah. Thanks, Harrison. Hey, have a great day. You too.